Chapter 31. Percy. Nothing like total failure to generate great ideas. As Percy stood there, disarmed and outmatched, the plan formed in his head. He was so used to Annabeth providing Greek legend information that he was kind of stunned to actually remember something useful, but he had to act fast. He couldn't let anything happen to his friends. He wasn't going to lose Annabeth, not again. Creosaur couldn't be beaten, at least not in single combat, but without his crew. Maybe then he could be overwhelmed if enough demigods attacked him at once. How to deal with Creosaur's crew? Percy put the pieces together. The pirates had been turned into dolphin men millennia ago when they had kidnapped the wrong person. Percy knew that story. Heck, the wrong person in question had threatened to turn him into a dolphin, and when Creosaur said the crew wasn't afraid of anything, one of the dolphins had nervously corrected him. Yes, Creosaur said, but he's not here. Percy glanced towards the stern and spotted Frank, in human form, peeking out from behind a ballista, waiting. Percy resisted the urge to smile. The big guy claimed to be clumsy and useless, but he always seemed to be in exactly the right place when Percy needed him. The girls. Frank. The ice chest. It was a crazy idea, but as usual, that's all Percy had. Fine, Percy shouted, so loudly, loudly that he got everyone's attention. Take us away, if our captain will let you. Creosaur turned his golden mask. What captain? My men searched the ship. There is no one else. Percy raised his hands dramatically. The god appears only when he wishes. But he is our leader. He runs our camp for demigods. Doesn't he, Annabeth? Annabeth was quick. Yes, she nodded enthusiastically. Mr. D, the great Dionysus. A ripple of uneasiness passed through the dolphin men. One dropped his sword. Stand fast, Creosaur bellowed. There is no god on this ship. They are trying to scare you. You should be scared. Percy looked at the pirate crew with sympathy. Dionysus will be severely cranky with you for having delayed our voyage. He will punish all of us. Didn't you notice the girls falling into the wine's god's madness? Hazel and Piper had stopped the fit shaking fits. They were sitting on the deck, staring at Percy. But when he glared at them, pointedly, they started hamming at it, at it again, trembling and flopping around like fish. The dolphin men fell over themselves trying to get away from their captives. Fakes! Creosaur roared. Shut up, Percy Jackson. Your camp director is not here. He was called to Olympus. This is common knowledge. So you admit Dionysus is our director? Percy said. He was, Creosaur corrected. Everyone knows that. Percy gestured at the golden warrior like he just betrayed himself. You see, we are doomed. If you don't believe me, let's check the ice chest. Percy stormed over to the magical cooler. No one tried to stop him. He knocked open the lid and rummaged through the ice. There had to be one, please. He was rewarded with a silver and red can of soda. He brandished it at the dolphin warriors as if spraying them with a bug repellent. Behold, Percy shouted, the gods' chosen beverage. Tremble before the horror of Diet Coke. The dolphin men began to panic. They were on the edge of retreat. Percy could feel it. The god will take your ship, Percy warned. He will finish your transformation into dolphins, or make you insane, or transform you into insane dolphins. Your only hope is to swim away now, quickly. Ridiculous! Creosaur's voice turned shrill. He didn't seem sure where to level his sword, at Percy or his own crew. Save yourselves, Percy warned. It is too late for us. Then he gasped and pointed to the spot where Frank was hiding. Oh no, Frank is turning into a crazy dolphin. Nothing happened. I said, Percy repeated, Frank is turning into a crazy dolphin. Frank stumbled out of nowhere, making a big show of grabbing his throat. Oh no, he said, like he was reading from a teleprompter. I am turning into a crazy dolphin. He began to change, his nose elongating into a snout, his skin becoming sleek and grey. He fell to the deck as a dolphin, his tail thumping against the boards. The pirate crew disbanded in terror, chattering and clicking as they dropped their weapons, forgot the captives, ignored Creosaur's orders, and jumped overboard. In the confusion, Annabeth moved quickly to cut the bonds on Hazel, Piper and Coach Hedge. Within seconds, Creosaur was alone and surrounded. Percy and his friends had no weapons except for Annabeth's knife and Hedge's hooves, but the murderous looks on their faces evidently convinced the golden warrior he was doomed. He backed to the edge of the rail. This isn't over, Jackson, Creosaur growled. I will have my revenge. His words were cut short by Frank, who had changed form again. An 800-pound grizzly bear can definitely break up a conversation. He sideswiped Creosaur and raked the golden mask off his helmet. Creosaur screamed, instantly covering his face with his arms and tumbling into the water. They ran to the rail. Creosaur had disappeared. Percy thought about chasing him, but he didn't know these waters, and he didn't want to confront that guy alone again. That was brilliant. Annabeth kissed him, which made him feel a little better. It was desperate, Percy corrected, and we need to get rid of this pirate Tererim. Burn it? Annabeth asked. 
Percy looked at the Diet Coke in his hand. No, I've got another idea. It took them longer than Percy wanted. As they worked, he kept glancing at the sea, waiting for Creosaur and his pirate dolphins to return, but they didn't. Leo got back on his feet, thanks to a little nectar. Piper tended to Jason's wounds, but he wasn't as badly hurt as he looked. Mostly he was just ashamed that he'd been overpowered again, which Percy could relate to. They returned all their own supplies to the proper places and tidied up from the invasion, while Coach Head had a field day on the enemy ship, breaking anything he could find with his baseball bat. When he was done, Percy loaded the enemy's weapons back on the pirate ship. Their storeroom was full of treasure, but Percy insisted that they touch none of it. I can sense about six million dollars worth of gold aboard, Hazel said, plus diamonds, rubies. Six m million, Frank stammered. Canadian dollars or American? Leave it, Percy said. It's part of the tribute. Tribute? Hazel asked. Oh, Piper nodded. Kansas. Jason grinned. He'd been there too when they'd met the wine god. Crazy, but I like it. Finally, Percy went aboard the pirate ship and opened the flood valves. He asked Leo to drill a few extra holes in the bottom of the hull with his power tools, and Leo was happy to oblige. The crew of the Argo 2 assembled at the rail and cut the grappling lines. Piper brought out her new horn of plenty, and on Percy's direction, willed it to spew Diet Coke, which came out with the strength of a fire hose, dousing the enemy deck. Percy thought it would take hours, but the ship sank remarkably fast, filling with Diet Coke and seawater. Dionysus, Percy called, holding up Creosaur's golden mask, or Bacchus, or whatever. You made this victory possible, even if you weren't here. Your enemies trembled at your name, or your Diet Coke or something. So yeah, thank you. The words were heard hard to get out, but Percy managed not to gag. We give this ship to you as a tribute. We hope you like it. Six million in gold, Leo muttered. He better like it. Shh, Hazel scolded. Precious metal isn't all that great, believe me. Percy threw the golden mask aboard the vessel, which was now sinking even faster, brown fizzy liquid spewing out of the Tareem's ore slots and bubbling from the cargo hold, turning the sea frothy brown. Percy summoned a wave, and the enemy ship was swamped. Leo steered the Argo 2 away as the pirate vessel disappeared underwater. Isn't that polluting? Piper asked. I wouldn't worry, Jason told her. If Bacchus likes it, the ship should vanish. Percy didn't know if that would happen, but he felt like he'd done all he could. He had no faith that Dionysus would hear them or care, much less help them in their battle against the twin giants, but he had to try. As the Argo 2 headed east into the fog, Percy decided at least one good thing had come out of his sword fight with Creosaur. He was feeling humble, even humble enough to pay tribute to the wine dude. After their bout with the pirates, they decided to fly the rest of the way to Rome. Jason insisted he was well enough to take sentry duty, along with Coach Hedge, who was still so charged with adrenaline that every time the ship hit turbulence, he swung his bat and yelled, Die! They had a couple of hours before daybreak, so Jason suggested Percy try to get a few more hours of sleep. It's fine, man, Jason said. Give somebody else a chance to save the ship, huh? Percy agreed, though once in his cabin, he had trouble falling asleep. He stared at the bronze lantern, swaying from the ceiling and thought about how easily Creosaur had beaten him at swordplay. The golden warrior could have killed him without breaking a sweat. He'd only kept Percy alive because someone else wants to pay for the privilege of killing him later. Percy felt like an arrow had slipped through a chink in his armour, as if he still had the blessing of Achilles and someone had found his sweet weak spot. The older he got, the longer he survived as a half-blood, the more his friends looked up to him. They depended on him and relied on his powers. Even the Romans had raised him on a shield and made him praetor, and he'd only known them for a couple of weeks. But Percy didn't feel powerful. The more heroic stuff he did, the more he realised how limited he was. He felt like a fraud. I'm not as great as you think, he wanted to warn his friends. His failures, like tonight, seemed to prove it. Maybe that's why he had started to fear suffocation. It wasn't so much drowning in the earth or the sea, but the feeling that he was sinking into too many expectations, literally getting in over his head. Wow, when he started having thoughts like that, he knew he'd been spending too much time with Annabeth. Athena had once told Percy his fatal flaw. He was supposedly too loyal to his friends. He didn't see the big picture. He would save a friend, even if it meant destroying the world. At the time, Percy had shrugged this off. How could loyalty be a bad thing? Besides, things had worked out okay against the Titans. He'd saved his friends and beaten Kronos. Now, though, he started to wonder... He would gladly throw himself at any monster, god or giant, to keep his friends from being hurt. But what if he wasn't up to the task? What if someone else had to do it? That was very hard for him to admit. He even had trouble with simple things, like letting Jason take a turn at watch. He didn't want to rely on someone else to protect him, someone who could get hurt on his account. 
Percy's mum had done that for him. She'd stayed in a bad relationship with a gross mortal guy because she thought it would save Percy from monsters. Grover, his best friend, had protected Percy for almost a year before Percy even realised he was a demigod, and Grover had almost been killed by the Minotaur. Percy wasn't a kid anymore. He didn't want anybody he loved taking a risk for him. He had to be strong enough to be the protector himself. But now he was supposed to let Annabeth go off on her own to follow the mark of Athena, knowing she might die. If it came to a choice, save Annabeth or let the quest succeed, could Percy really choose the quest? Exhaustion finally overtook him. He fell asleep, and in his nightmare the rumble of thunder became the laughter of the earth goddess Gaia. Percy dreamed he was standing on the front porch of the big house at Camp Halfblood. The sleeping face of Gaia appeared on the side of Halfblood Hill. Her massive features formed from the shadows on the grassy slopes. Her lips didn't move, but her voice echoed across the valley. So this is your home, Gaia murmured. Take a last look, Percy Jackson. You should have returned here. At least then you could have died with your comrades when the Romans invaded. Now your blood will be spilled far from home on the ancient stones and I will rise. The ground shook. At the top of Half-Blood Hill, Thalia's pine tree burst into flames. Disruption rolled across the valley. Grass turning to sand, forest crumbling to dust. The river in the canoe, late lake, dried up. The cabins and the big house burned to ashes. When the tremor stopped, Camp Half-Blood looked like a wasteland after an atomic blast. The only thing left was the porch where Percy stood. Next to him, the dust swirled and solidified into the figure of a woman. Her eyes were closed, as if she was sleepwalking. Her robes were forest green, dappled with gold and white like sunlight, shifting through branches. Her hair was as black as tilled soil. Her face was beautiful, but even with a dreamy smile on her lips, she seemed cold and distant. Percy got the feeling she could watch demigods die or cities burn, and that smile wouldn't waver. When I reclaim the earth, Gaia said, I will leave this spot barren forever, to remind me of your kind and how utterly powerless they were to stop me. It doesn't matter when you fall, my sweet little pawn. To Phorsis or Creosaur or my dear twins, you will fall, and I will be there to devour you. Your only choice now, will you fall alone? Come to me willingly, bring the girl. Perhaps I will spare this place you love. Otherwise. Gaia opened her eyes. They swirled in green and black, as deep as the crust of the earth. Gaia saw everything. Her patience was infinite. She was slow to wake, but once she arose, her power was unstoppable. Percy's skin tingled. His hands went numb. He looked down and realised he was crumbling to dust, like all the monsters he'd ever, ever defeated. Enjoy Tartarus, my little pawn, my little pawn, Gaia purred. A metallic clang, clang, clang jolted Percy out of his dream. His eyes shot again. He realised he just heard the landing gear being lowered. There was a knock on his door and Jason poked his head in. The bruises on his face had faded. His blue eyes glittered with excitement. Hey man, he said, we're descending over Rome. You really should see this. The sky was brilliant blue, as if the stormy weather had never happened. The sun rose over the distant hills, so everything below them shone and sparkled like the entire city of Rome had just come out of the car wash. Percy had seen big cities before. He was from New York, after all, but the sheer vastness of Rome grabbed him by the throat and made it hard to breathe. The city seemed to have no regard for the limits of geography. It spread through hills and valleys, jumped over the Tiber with dozens of bridges, and just kept sprawling to the horizon. Streets and alleys zigzagged, with no rhyme or reason, through quilts of neighbourhoods. Gla glass office buildings stood next to ex excavation sites. A cathedral stood next to the line of Roman columns, which stood next to a modern football stadium. In some neighbourhoods, old stucco villas with red tiled roofs crowded the cobblestone streets, so that if Percy concentrated just on those areas, he could imagine he was back in ancient times. Everywhere he looked, there were wide piazzas and traffic-clogged streets, parks cut across the city with a crazy collection of palm trees, pines, junipers and olive trees, as if Rome couldn't decide what part of the world it belonged to, or maybe it just believed all the world still belonged to Rome. It was as if the city knew about Percy's dream of Gaia. It knew that the Earth Goddess intended on raising all human civilization, and this city, which had stood for thousands of years, was saying back to her, You want to dissolve this city? Dirt face? Give it a shot. In other words, it was the coach hedge of mortal cities, only taller. We're setting down in that park, Leo announced, pointing to a wide green space dotted with palm trees. Let's hope the mist makes us look like a large pigeon or something. Percy wished Jason's sister, Thalia, was here. She'd always had a way of bending the mist to make people see what she wanted. Percy had never been very good at that. He just kept thinking, don't look at me, and hoped the Romans below would fail to notice the giant bronze trireme descending on their city in the middle of a morning rush hour. It seemed to work. 
Percy didn't notice any cars veering off the road or Romans pointing to the sky and screaming, Aliens! The Argo too sat down in the grassy field and the oars retracted. The noise of traffic was all around them, but the park itself was peaceful and deserted. To their left, a green lawn sloped towards a line of woods. An old villa nestled in the shade of some weird-looking pine trees with thin, curvy trunks that shot up 30 or 40 feet, then sprouted into puffy canopies. They reminded Percy of trees in those doctor's use books his mum used to read him when he was little. To their right, snaking along the top of a hill, was a long brick wall with notches at the top for archers. Maybe a medieval defensive line, maybe ancient Roman, Percy wasn't sure. To the north, about a mile away through the folds of the city, the top of the Colosseum rose above the rooftops, looking just like it did in travel photos. That's when Percy's legs started shaking. He was actually here. He'd thought his trip to Alaska had been pretty exotic, but now he was in the heart of the old Roman Empire, enemy territory for a Greek demigod. In a way, this place had shaped his life as much as New York. Jason pointed to the base of the archer's wall, where steps led down into some kind of tunnel. I think I know where we are, he said. That's the tomb of the Scipios. Percy frowned. Scipio? Rainus Pegasus? No, Annabeth put in. They were a noble Roman family, and wow, wow, this place is amazing. Jason nodded. I've studied maps of Rome before. I've always wanted to come here, but... Nobody bothered finishing that sentence. Looking at his friends' faces, Percy could tell they were just in as much in awe as he was. They'd made it. They'd landed in Rome. The Rome. Plans? Hazel asked. Nico has until sunset, at best, and the entire city is supposedly getting destroyed today. Percy shook himself out of his daze. You're right, Annabeth. Did you zero in on that spot from your bronze map? Her grey eyes turned extra thunderstorm dark, which Percy could interpret just fine. Remember what I said, buddy. Keep that dream to yourself. Yes, she said carefully. It's on the Tiber River. I think I can find it, but I should... Take me along, Percy finished. Yeah, you're right. Annabeth glared daggers at him. That's not... Safe, he replied. One demigod walking through Rome alone. I'll go with you as far as the Tiber. We can use that letter of introduction. Hopefully meet the river god, Tiberinus. Maybe he can give you some help or advice. Then you can go on alone from there. They had a silent staring contest, but Percy didn't back down. When he and Annabeth started dating, his mother had drummed it into his head. It's good manners to walk your date to the door. If that was true, it had to be good manners to walk her to the start of her epic solo death quest. Fine, Annabeth muttered. Hazel, now that we're in Rome, do you think you can pinpoint Nico's location? Hazel blinked, as if coming out of a trance from watching the Percy Annabeth show. Um, hopefully, if I get close enough, I'll have to walk around the city. Frank, would you come with me? Frank beamed. Absolutely. And, uh, Leo? Hazel added. It might be a good idea if you came along too. The fish centaur said we'd need your help with something mechanical. Yeah, Leo said. No problem. Frank's smile turned into something more like Creosaur's mask. Percy was no genius when it came to relationships, but even he could feel the tension among these three. Ever since they'd been knocked into the Atlantic, they hadn't quite acted the same. It wasn't just the two guys competing for Hazel. It was like the three of them were locked together, acting out some kind of murder mystery, but they hadn't yet discovered which of them was the victim. Piper drew her knife and set it on the rail. Jason and I can watch the ship for now. I'll see what Catoptris can show me. But Hazel, if you guys get a fix on Nico's location, don't go in there by yourselves. Come back and get us. I'll take all of us to fight the giants. She didn't say the obvious. Even all of them together wouldn't be enough, unless they had God on their side. A God. Percy decided not to bring that up. Good idea, Percy said. How about we plan to meet back here at what? Three this afternoon, Jason suggested. That's probably the latest we could rendezvous and still hope to fight the giants and save Nico. If something happens to change the plan, try to send an iris message. The others nodded in agreement, but Percy noticed several of them glancing at Annabeth. Another thing no one wanted to say. Annabeth would be on a different schedule. She might be back at three or much later or never, but she would be on her own, searching for the Athena Parthenos. Coach Hedge grunted. That'll give me time to eat the coconuts. I mean, dig the coconut coconuts out of our hull. Percy, Annabeth, I don't like you two going off on your own. Just remember, behave. If I hear about any funny business, I will ground you until the sticks freezes over. The idea of getting grounded when they were about to risk their lives was so ridiculous Percy couldn't help smiling. We'll be back soon, he promised. He looked around at his friends, trying not to feel like this was the last time they'd ever be together. Good luck, everyone. Leo lowered the gangplank, and Percy and Annabeth were first off the ship. Chapter 32 Percy 
Under different circumstances, wandering through Rome of Annabeth would have been pretty awesome. They held hands as they navigated the winding streets, dodging cars and crazy Vespa drivers, squeezing through mobs of tourists and wading through oceans of pigeons. The day warmed up quickly. Once they got away from the car exhaust on the main roads, the air smelled of baking bread and freshly cut flowers. They aimed for the Colosseum because that was an easy landmark, but getting there proved harder than Percy anticipated. As big and confusing as the city had looked from above, it was even more so on the ground. Several times they got lost on dead-end streets. They found beautiful fountains and huge monuments by accident. Annabeth commented on the architecture, but Percy kept his eyes open for other things. Once he spotted a glowing purple ghost, Alar, glaring at them from the window of an apartment building. Another time he saw a white-robed woman, maybe a nymph or a goddess, holding a wicked-looking knife, slipping between ruined columns in a public path. Nothing attacked them, but Percy felt like they were being watched, and the watchers were not friendly. Finally, they reached the Colosseum, where a dozen guys in cheap gladiator costumes were scuffling with the police, plastic swords versus batons. Percy wasn't sure what that was about, but he and Annabeth decided to keep walking. Sometimes mortals were even stranger than monsters. They made their way west, stopping every once in a while to ask directions to the driver, to the river. Percy hadn't considered that. Duh, people in Italy spoke Italian, while well, he did not. As it turned out, though, that wasn't much of a problem. The few times someone approached them on the street and asked a question, Percy just looked at them in confusion, and they switched to English. Next discovery, the Italians used euros, and Percy didn't have any. He regretted this as soon as he found a tourist shop that sold sodas. By then it was almost noon, getting really hot, and Percy was starting to wish he had a tureen filled with Diet Coke. Annabeth solved the problem. She dug around in her backpack, brought out Daedalus's laptop, and typed in a few commands. A plastic card ejected from a slot in the side. Annabeth waved it triumphantly. International credit card. For emergencies. Percy stared at her in amazement. How did you? No, never mind. I just... I, I don't want to know. Just keep being awesome. The sodas helped, but they were still hot and tired by the time they arrived at the Tiber River. The shore was edged with a stone embankment. A chaotic assortment of warehouses, apartments, stores and cafes crowded the riverfront. The Tiber itself was wide, lazy and caramel-coloured. A few tall cypress trees hung over the banks. The nearest bridge looked fairly new, made from iron girders, but right next to it stood a crumbling line of stone arches that stopped halfway across the river. Ruins that might have been left over from the days of the Caesars. This is it. Annabeth pointed at the old stone bridge. I recognised that from the map. But what do we do now? Percy was glad she had said we. He didn't want to leave her yet. In fact, he wasn't sure he could make himself do it when the time came. Gaia's words came back to him. Will you fall alone? He stared at the river, wondering how they may could make contact with the god Tiberinus. He didn't really want to jump in. The Tiber didn't look much cleaner than the East River back home, where he'd had too many encounters with grouchy river spirits. He gestured to a nearby cafe with tables overlooking the water. It's about lunchtime. How about we try your credit card again? Even though it was noon, the place was empty. They picked a table outside by the river, and a waiter hurried over. He looked a bit surprised to see them, especially when they said they wanted lunch. American, he asked, with a pained smile. Yes, Annabeth said. And uh, I'd love a pizza, Percy said. The waiter looked like he was trying to swallow a euro coin. Of course you would, senora. And let me guess, uh, a Coca-Cola with, with ice. Uh, awesome, Percy said. He didn't understand why the guy was giving him such a sour face. It wasn't like Percy had asked for a blue Coke. Annabeth ordered a panini and some fizzy water. After the waiter left, she smiled at Percy. I think Italians eat a lot later in the day. They don't put ice in their drinks, and they only do pizza for tourists. Oh, Percy shrugged. The best Italian food, and they don't even eat it. I wouldn't say that in front of the waiter. They held hands across the table. Percy was content just to look at Annabeth in the sunlight. It always made her hair so bright and warm. Her eyes took on the colours of the sky, and the cobblestones, alternately brown or blue. He wondered if he should tell Annabeth his dream about Gaia, destroy, destroying Camp Half-Blood. He decided against it. She didn't need anything else to worry about, not with what she was facing. But it made him wonder, what would have happened if they hadn't scared off Creosaur's pirates? Percy and Annabeth would have been put in chains and taken to Gaia's minions. Their blood would have been spilled on ancient stones. Percy guessed that meant they would have been taken to Greece for some big horrible sacrifice. But Annabeth and he had been plenty in plenty of bad situations before. They could have figured out an escape plan, saved the day, and Annabeth wouldn't be facing this solo quest in Rome. Doesn't matter when you fall, Gaia had said. Percy knew it was a horrible wish, but he had almost regretted that they hadn't been captured at sea. At least Annabeth and he would have been together. 
You shouldn't feel ashamed, Annabeth said. You're thinking about Creosote, aren't you? Swords can't solve every problem. You saved us in the end. In spite of himself, Percy smiled. How do you do that? You always know what I'm thinking. I know you, she said. And you like me anyway, Percy wanted to ask, but he held it back. Percy, she said, you can't carry the weight of this whole quest. It's impossible. That's why there are seven of us, and you'll have to let me search for the Athena Parthenos on my own. I missed you, he confessed. For months, a huge chunk of our lives was taken away. If I lost you again... Lunch arrived. The waiter looked much calmer, having accepted the fact that they were clueless Americans. He apparently decided to forgive them and treat them politely. It is a beautiful view, he said, nodding towards the river. Enjoy, please. Once he left, they ate in silence. The pizza was a bland, doughy square with, a no with not a lot of cheese. Maybe, Percy thought, that's why Romans didn't eat it. Poor Romans. You'll have to trust me, Annabeth said. Percy almost thought she was talking to her sandwich because she didn't meet his eyes. You've got to believe I'll come back. He swallowed another bite. I believe in you. That's not the problem. But come back from where? The sound of a vesper interrupted them. Percy looked along the riverfront and did a double take. The motor scooter was an old-fashioned model, big and baby blue. The driver was a guy in a silky grey suit. Behind him sat a younger woman with a headscarf, her hands around the man's waist. They weaved between cafe tables and puttered to a stop next to Percy and Annabeth. Why, hello, the man said. His voice was deep, almost croaky like a movie actor's. His hair was short and greased back from his craggy face. He was handsome in a 1950s dad-on-television way. Even his clothes seemed old-fashioned. When he stepped off his bike, the waistline of his slacks was way higher than normal, but somehow he still managed to look manly and stylish and not like a total goober. Percy had trouble guessing his age, maybe 30-something, though the man's fashion and manner seemed grandfatherish. The woman slid off the bike. We've had the most lovely morning she said breathlessly. She looked about 21, also dressed in an old-fashioned style. Her ankle-length marigold skirt and white blouse were pinched together with a large leather belt, giving her the narrowest waist Percy had ever seen. When she removed her scarf, her short wavy black hair bounced into perfect shape. She had dark, playful eyes and a brilliant smile. Percy had seen naiads and looked less pixieish than this lady. Annabeth's sandwich fell out of her hands. Oh, gods! How? How? She seemed so stunned that Percy figured he ought to know these two. You guys do look familiar, he decided. He thought he might have seen their faces on television. It seemed like they were from an old show, but that couldn't be right. They hadn't aged at all. Nevertheless, he pointed at the guy and took a guess. Are you that guy on Mad Men? Percy. Annabeth looked horrified. What? He protested. I don't watch a lot of TV. That's Gregory Peck. Annabeth's eyes were wide and her mouth kept falling open and... Oh, gods, Audrey Hepburn. I know this movie, Roman Holiday, but that was from the 1950s. How? Oh, my dear. The woman twirled like an air spirit and sat down at the table. I'm afraid you've mistaken me for someone else. My name is Rhea Sylvia. I was the mother to Romulus and Remus thousands of years ago, but you're so kind to think I look as young as the 1950s, and this is my husband. Tiberinus, said Gregory Peck, thrusting out his hand to Percy in a manly way, guard of the river Tiber. Percy shook his hand. The guy smelled of aftershave. Of course, if Percy were the Tiber, Tiber River, he'd probably want to mask the smell of cologne too. Uh, hi, Percy said. Do you two always look like American movie stars? Do we? Tiberinus frowned and studied his clothes. I'm not sure, actually. The migration of Western civilization goes both ways, you know. Rome affected the world, but the world also affects Rome. There does seem to be a lot of American influence lately. I've rather lost track over the centuries. Okay, Percy said, but uh, you're here to help? My naiads told me you two were here. Tiberinus cast his dark eyes towards Annabeth. You have the map, my dear. And your letter of introduction? Uh, Annabeth handed him the letter and the disc of bronze. She was staring at the river god so intently, Percy started to feel jealous. So, so she stammered, you've helped other children of Athena with this quest? Oh, my dear. The pretty lady, Rhea Sylvia, put her hand on Annabeth's shoulder. Tiberinus is ever so helpful. He saved my children, Romulus and Remus, you know, and brought them to the wolf goddess, Lupa. Later, when that old king, Numan, tried to kill me, Tiberinus took pity on me and made me, me his wife. I've been ruling the river kingdom at his side ever since. He's just dreamy. Thank you, my dear, Tiberinus said with a wry smile. And yes, Annabeth Chase, I've helped many of your siblings to at least begin their journey safely. A shame all of them died painfully later on. Well, your documents seem in order. We should get going. The mark of Athena awaits.
Percy gripped Annabeth's hand, probably a little too tight. Tiberinus, let me go with her, just a little further. Rhea Sylvia laughed sweetly. But you can't, silly boy. You must return to your ship and gather your other friends. Confront the giants. The way will appear in your friend Piper's knife. Annabeth has a different path. She must walk alone. Indeed, Tiberinus said. Annabeth must face the guardian of the shrine by herself. It is the only way, and Percy Jackson, you have less time than you realise to rescue your friend in the jar. You must hurry. Percy's pizza fell like a cement lump in his stomach. But it's all right, Percy. Annabeth squeezed his hand. I need to do this. He started to protest. Her expression stopped him. She was terrified, but doing her best to hide it for his sake. If he tried to argue, he would only make things harder for her, or worse, he might convince her to stay. Then she would have to live with the knowledge that she'd back down from her biggest challenge, assuming that they survived at all, with Rome about to get levelled and Gaia about to rise and destroy the world. The Athena statue held the key to defeating the giants. Percy didn't know why or how, but Annabeth was the only one who could find it. You're right, he said, forcing out the words. Be safe. Rhea Sylvia giggled like it was a ridiculous comment. Safe? Not at all, but, but necessary. Come, Annabeth, my dear, we will show you where the path starts. After that, you're on your own. Annabeth kissed Percy. She hesitated, like she was wondering what else to say. Then she shouldered her backpack and climbed on the back of the scooter. Percy hated it. He would have preferred to fight any monster in the world. He would have preferred a rematch with Creosaur, but he forced himself to stay in his chair and watch as Annabeth motored off through the streets of Rome with Gregory Peck and Audrey Hepburn. Chapter 33. Annabeth. Annabeth figured it could have been worse. If she had to go on a horrifying solo quest, at least she'd be able to have lunch with Percy on the banks of the Tiber first. Now she got to take a scooter ride with Gregory Peck. She only knew about that old movie because of her dad. Over the past few years, since the two of them had made up, they'd spent more time together. She had learned that her dad had a sappy side. Sure, he liked military history, weapons and biplanes, but he also loved old films, especially romantic comedies from the 1940s and 50s. Roman Holiday was one of his favourites. He'd made Annabeth watch it. She thought the plot was silly. A princess escapes her minders and falls in love with an American journalist in Rome, but she suspected her dad liked it because it reminded him of his own romance with the goddess Athena, another impossible pairing that couldn't end happily. Her dad was nothing like Gregory Peck. Athena certainly wasn't anything like Audrey Hepburn, but Annabeth knew that people saw what they wanted to see. They didn't need the mist to warp their perceptions. As the baby blue scooter zipped through the streets of Rome, the goddess Rhea Sylvia gave Annabeth a running commentary on how the city had changed over the centuries. The Sublican Bridge was over there, she said, pointing to a bend in the Tiber. You know, where Horatius and his two friends defended the city from an invading army? Now, there was a brave Roman. And look, dear, Tiberinus added, that's the place where Romulus and Remus washed ashore. He seemed to be talking about a spot on the riverside where some ducks were making a nest out of torn up plastic bags and candy wrappers. Ah, yes, Rhea Sylvia sighed happily. You were so kind to flood yourself and wash my babies ashore for the wolves to find. It was nothing, Tiberinus said. Annabeth felt light-headed. The river god was talking about something that had happened thousands of years ago, when this area was nothing but marshes and maybe some shacks. Tiberinus saved two babies. One of them went on to found the world's greatest empire. It was nothing. Rhea Sylvia pointed out a large modern apartment building. That used to be a temple to Venus. Then it was a church, then a palace, then an apartment building. It burned down three times. Now it's an apartment building again. And that spot right there. Please, Annabeth said. You're making me dizzy. Rhea Sylvia laughed. I'm sorry, dear. Layers upon layers of history here. But it's nothing compared to Greece. Athens was old when Rome was a collection of, of mud huts. You'll see if you survive. Not helping, Annabeth muttered. Here we are. Tiberinus announced. He pulled over in front of a large marble building, the facade covered in city grime but still beautiful. Ornate carvings of Roman gods decorated the roofline. The massive entrance was barred with iron gates, heavily padlocked. I'm going in there. Annabeth wished she'd brought Leo, or at least borrowed some wire cutters from his tool belt. Rhea Sylvia covered her mouth and giggled. No, my dear, not in it, under it. Tiberinus pointed to a set of stone steps on the side of the building, the sort of the sort that would have led to a basement apartment if this place were in Manhattan. Rome is chaotic above ground, Tiberinus said, but that's nothing compared to below ground. You must descend into the buried city, Annabeth Chase. Find the altar of the foreign god. The failures of your predecessors will guide you. After that, I do not know. Annabeth's backpack felt heavy on her shoulders. 
She'd been studying the bronze map for days now, scouring Daedalus's laptop for information. Unfortunately, the few things she had learned made this quest seem even more impossible. My siblings, none of them made it all the way to the shrine, did they? Tiberinus shook his head. But you know what prize awaits if you can liberate it. Yes, Annabeth said. It could bring peace to the children of Greece and Rome, Rhea Sylvia said. It could change the course of the coming war. If I live, Annabeth said. Tiberinus nodded sadly. Because you also understand the guardian you must face? Annabeth remembered the spiders at Fort Sumter and the dream Percy had described, the hissing voice in the dark. Yes. Rhea Sylvia looked at her husband. She is brave. Perhaps she is stronger than the others. I hope so, said the river god. Goodbye, Annabeth Chase, and good luck. Rhea Sylvia beamed. We have such a lovely afternoon planned. Off to shop. Gregory Peck and Audrey Hepburn sped off on their baby blue, baby blue motorbike. Then Annabeth turned and descended the steps alone. She'd been underground plenty of times, but halfway down the steps she realised just how long it had been since she'd adventured by herself. She froze. Gods, she hadn't done something like this since she was a kid. After running away from home, she'd spent a few weeks surviving on her own, living in alleyways and hiding from monsters until Thalia and Luke took her under their wing. Then, once she'd arrived at Camp Half-Blood, she'd lived there until she was twelve. After that, all her quests had been with Percy or her other friends. The last time she had felt this scared and alone, she'd been seven years old. She remembered the day Thalia, Luke and she had wandered into a cyclops lair in Brooklyn. Thalia and Luke had been captured and Annabeth had had to cut them free. She still remembered shivering in a dark corner of that dilapidated mansion, listening to the cyclopses mimicking her friends' voices, trying to trick her into coming out into the open. What if this is a trick too, she wondered. What if those other children of Athena died because Tiberinus and Rhea Sylvia led them into a trap? Would Gregory Peck and Audrey Hepburn do something like that? She forced herself to keep going. She had no choice. If the Athena Parthenos was really down here, it could decide the fate of the war. More importantly, it could help her mum. Athena needed her. At the bottom of the steps, she reached an old wooden door with an iron pool ring. Above the ring was a metal plate with a keyhole. Annabeth started considering ways to pick the lock, but as soon as she touched the pool, pool ring, a fiery shape burned in the middle of the door, the silhouette of Athena's owl. Smoke plumed from the keyhole, the door swung inwards. Annabeth looked up one last time. At the top of the stairwell, the sky was a square of brilliant blue. Mortals would be enjoying the warm afternoon. Couples would be holding hands at the cafes. Tourists would be bustling through the shops and museums. Regular Romans would be going about their daily business, probably not considering the thousands of years of history under their feet, and definitely unaware of the spirits, gods and monsters that still dwelt here, or the fact that their city might be destroyed today unless a certain group of demigods succeeded in stopping the giants. Annabeth stepped through the doorway. She found herself in a basement that was an architectural cyborg. Ancient brick walls were crisscrossed with modern electrical cables and plumbing. The ceiling was held up with a combination of steel scaffolding and old granite Roman columns. The front half of the basement was stacked with crates. Out of curiosity, Annabeth opened a few. Some were packed with multicoloured spools of string, like for kites or arts and crafts projects. Other crates were full of cheap plastic gladiator swords. Maybe at one point this had been a storage area for a tourist shop. In the back of the basement, the floor had been excavated, revealing another set of steps, these of white stone, leading still deeper underground. Annabeth crept to the edge. Even with the glow cast by her dagger, it was too dark to see below. She rested her hand on the wall and found a light switch. She flipped it. Glaring white fluorescent bulbs illuminated the stairs. Below, she saw a mosaic floor decorated with deer and fawns, maybe a room from an ancient Roman villa, just stashed away under the modern basement along with the crates of string and plastic swords. She climbed down. The room was about 20 feet square. The walls had once been brightly painted, but most of the fr frescoes had peeled or faded. The only exit was a hole dug in one corner of the floor where the mosaic had been pulled up. Annabeth crouched next to the opening. It dropped straight down into a larger cavern, but Annabeth couldn't see the bottom. She heard running water maybe 30 or 40 feet below. The air didn't smell like a sewer, just old and musty and slightly sweet, like mouldering flowers. Perhaps it was an old water line from the aqueducts, there was no way down. I'm not jumping, she muttered to herself. As if in reply, something glowed in the darkness. The mark of Athena blazed to life at the bottom of the cavern, revealing glistening brickwork along a subterranean canal 40 feet below. The fiery owl seemed to be taunting her. Well, this is the way, kid, so you better figure something out. Annabeth considered her options. Too dangerous to jump. No ladders or ropes. She thought about borrowing some metal scaffolding from above to use as a fire pole, but it was all bolted in place. Besides, she didn't want to cause the building to collapse on top of her. 
Frustration crawled through her like an army of termites. She had spent her life watching other demigods gain amazing powers. Percy could control water. If he were here, he could raise the water level and simply float down. Hazel, from what she had said, could find her way underground with flawless accuracy and even create or change the course of tunnels. She could easily make a new path. Leo would pull just the right tools from his belt and build something to do the job. Frank could turn into a bird. Jason could simply control the wind and float down. Even Piper with her charm speak. She could have convinced Tiberinus and Rhea Sylvia to be a little help more helpful. What did Annabeth have? A bronze dagger that did nothing special and a cursed silver coin. She had a backpack with Daedalus's laptop, a water bottle, a few pieces of ambrosia for emergencies and a box of matches. Probably useless, but her dad had drilled into her head that she should always have a way to make fire. She had no amazing powers. Even her one true magic item, her New York Yankees cap of invisibility, had stopped working and was still back in her cabin on the Argo too. You've got your intelligence, a voice said. Annabeth wondered if Athena was speaking to her, but that was probably just wishful thinking. Intelligence, like Athena's favourite hero, Odysseus. He won the Trojan War with cleverness, not strength. He had overcome all sorts of monsters and hardships with his quick wits. That's what Athena valued. Wisdom's daughter walks alone. That didn't mean just without other people, Annabeth realised. It meant without any special powers. Okay, so how to get down there safely and make sure she had a way to get out again if necessary. She climbed back to the basement and stared at the open crates. Kite string and plastic swords. The idea that came to her was so ridiculous she almost had to laugh, but it was better than nothing. She set to work. Her hands seemed to know exactly what to do. Sometimes that happened, like when she was helping Leo with the ship's machinery or drawing architectural plans on the computer. She'd never made anything out of kite string and plastic swords, but it seemed easy, natural. Within minutes, she'd used a dozen balls of string and a crate full of swords to create a makeshift rope ladder, a braided line woven for strength yet not too thick, with swords tied at two foot intervals to serve as hand and footholds. As a test, she tied one end around a support column and leaned on the rope with all her weight. The plastic swords bent under her, but they provided some extra bulk to the knots in the cord, so at least she could keep a better grip. The ladder wouldn't win any design awards, but it might get her to the bottom of the cavern safely. First, she stuffed her backpack with the leftover spools of string. She wasn't sure why, but they were one more resource and not too heavy. She headed back to the hole in the mosaic floor. She secured one end of her ladder to the nearest piece of scaffolding, lowered the rope into the cavern, and shinned down. Chapter 34. Annabeth. As Annabeth hung in the air, descending hand over hand with a ladder swinging wildly, she thanked Chiron for all those years of training on the climbing course at Camp Halfblood. She complained loudly and often that rope climbing would never help her defeat a monster. Chiron had just smiled, like he knew this day would come. Finally, Annabeth made it to the bottom. She missed the brickwork edge and landed in the canal, but it turned out to be only a few inches deep. Freezing water soaked into her running shoes. She held up her glowing dagger. The shallow channel ran down the middle of a brickwork tunnel. Every few yards, ceramic pipes jutted from the walls. She guessed that the pipes were drains, part of the ancient Roman plumbing system, though it was amazing to her that a tunnel like this had survived, crowded underground with all the other centuries worth of pipes, basements and sewers. A sudden thought chilled her even more than the water. A few years ago, Percy and she had gone on a quest in Daedalus's labyrinth, a secret network of tunnels and rooms, heavily enchanted and trapped, which ran under all the cities of America. When Daedalus died in the Battle of the Labyrinth, the entire maze had collapsed, or so Annabeth believed. But what if that was only in America? What if this was an older version of the labyrinth? Daedalus once told her that his maze had a life of its own. It was constantly growing and changing. Maybe the labyrinth could regenerate like monsters. That would make sense. It was an archetypal force, as Chiron would say, something that could never really die. If this was part of the labyrinth... Annabeth decided not to dwell on that, but she also decided not to assume her directions were accurate. The labyrinth made distance meaningless. If she wasn't careful, she could walk 20 feet in the wrong direction and end up in Poland. Just to be safe, she tied a new ball of string at the end of her rope ladder. She could unravel it behind her as she explored. An old trick, but a good one. She debated which way to go. The tunnel seemed the same in both directions. Then, about 50 feet to her left, the mark of Athena blazed against the wall. Annabeth could swear it was glaring at her with those big fiery eyes, as if to say, what's your problem? Hurry up. She was really starting to hate that owl. By the time she reached the spot, the image had faded and she'd run out of string on her first spool. As she was attaching a new line, she glanced across the tunnel. There was a broken section in the brickwork, as if a sledgehammer had knocked a hole in the wall. 
She crossed to take a look, sticking her dagger through the opening for light. Annabeth could see a lower chamber, long and narrow, with a mosaic floor, painted walls and benches running down either side. It was shaped sort of like a subway car. She stuck her head into the hole, hoping nothing would bite it off. At the near end of the room was a bricked-off doorway. At the far end was a stone table, or maybe an altar. Hmm. The water tunnel kept going, but Annabeth was sure this was the way. She remembered what Tiberinus had said, find the altar of the foreign god. There didn't seem to be any exits from the altar room, but it was a short drop onto the bench below. She should be able to climb out again with no problem. Still holding her string, she lowered herself down. The room's ceiling was barrel-shaped with brick arches, but Am Annabeth didn't like the look of the supports. Directly above her head, on the arch nearest to the bricked-in doorway, the capstone was cracked in half. Stress fractures ran across the ceiling. The place had probably been intact for 2,000 years, but she decided she'd rather not spend too much time here. With her luck, it would collapse in the next two minutes. The floor was a long, narrow mosaic with seven pictures in a row, like a timeline. At Annabeth's feet was a raven. Next was a lion. Several others looked like Roman warriors with various weapons. The rest were too damaged or covered in dust for Annabeth to make out details. The benches on either side were littered with broken pottery. The walls were painted with scenes of a banquet, a robed man with a curved cap like an ice cream scoop, sitting next to a larger guy who radiated sunbeams. Standing around them were torchbearers and servants, and various animals like crows and lions wandered in the background. Annabeth wasn't sure what the picture represented, but it didn't remind her of any Greek legends that she knew. At the far end of the room, the altar was elaborately carved, with a frieze showing the man with the ice cream scoop hat holding a knife to the neck of a bull. On the altar stood a stone figure of a man sunk to his knees in rock, a dagger and a torch in his outraised hands. Again, Annabeth had no idea what these images meant. She took one step towards the altar. Her foot went crunch. She looked down and realised she'd just put her shoe through a human ribcage. Annabeth swallowed back a scream. What had that come from? She had glanced down only a moment before and hadn't seen any bones. Now the floor was littered with them. The ribcage was obviously old. It crumbled to dust as she removed her foot. Nearby lay a corroded bronze dagger, very much like her own. Either this dead person had been carrying the weapon, or it had killed him. She held out her blade to see in front of her. A little further down the mosaic path sprawled a more complete skeleton in the remains of embroidered red doublet, like a man from the Renaissance. His frilled collar and skull had been badly burned, as if the guy had decided to wash his hair with a blowtorch. Wonderful, Annabeth thought. She lifted her eyes to the altar statue, which held a dagger and a torch. Some kind of test, Annabeth decided. These two guys had failed. Correction, not just two guys. More bones and scraps of clothing were scattered all the way to the altar. She couldn't guess how many skeletons were represented, but she was willing to bet they were all demigods from the past, children of Athena, on the same quest. It will not be another skeleton on your floor, she called to the statue, hoping she sounded brave. A girl, said a watery voice, echoing through the room. Girls are not allowed. A female demigod, said, said a second voice. Inexcusable. The chamber rumbled. Dust fell from the cracked ceiling. Annabeth bolted for the hole she'd come through, but it had disappeared. Her string had been severed. She clambered up on the bench and pounded on the wall where the hole had been, hoping the hole's absence was just an illusion. But she felt the wall felt solid. She was trapped. Along with benches, a, a dozen ghosts shimmered into existence. Glowing purple men in Roman togas, like the lairs she'd seen at Camp Jupiter. They glared at her as if she'd interrupted their meeting. She did the only thing she could. She stepped down from the bench and put her back to the bricked-in doorway. She tried to look confident, though the scowling purple ghosts and the demigod skeletons at her feet made her want to turtle into her t-shirt and scream. I'm a child of Athena, she said, as boldly as she could manage. A Greek, one of the ghosts said with disgust. That is even worse. At the other end of the chamber, an old-looking ghost rose with some difficulty. Do ghosts have arthritis? And stood by the altar, his dark eyes fixed on Annabeth. Her first thought was that he looked like the Pope. He had a glittering robe, a pointed hat, and a shepherd's crook. This is the cavern of Mithras, said the old ghost. You have disturbed our sacred rituals. You cannot look upon our mysteries and live. I don't want to look upon your mysteries, Annabeth assured him. I'm following the mark of Athena. Show me the exit and I'll be on my way. Her voice sounded calm, which surprised her. She had no idea how to get out of here, but she knew she had to succeed where her siblings had failed. Her path led further on, deeper into the underground layers of Rome. The failures of your predecessors will guide you, Tiberinus had said. After that, I do not know. 
The ghosts mumbled to each other in Latin. Annabeth caught a few unkind words about female demigods and Athena. Finally, the ghost with the Pope the hat struck his shepherd's crook against the floor. The other lairs fell silent. Your Greek goddess is powerless here, said the Pope. Mithras is the god of Roman warriors. He is the god of the legion, the god of the empire. He wasn't even Roman, Annabeth protested. Wasn't he like Persian or something? Sacrilege, the old man yelped, banging his staff on the floor a few more times. Mithras prote protects us. I am the pater of his, this brotherhood. The father, Annabeth translated. Do not interrupt. As pater, I must protect our mysteries. What mysteries? Annabeth asked. A dozen dead guys in togas sitting around in a cave. The ghosts muttered and complained until the pater got them under control with a taxi cab whistle. The old guy had a good set of lungs. You are clearly an unbeliever. Like the others, you must die. The others... Annabeth made an effort not to look at the skeletons. Her mind worked furiously, grasping for anything she knew about Mithras. He had a secret cult for warriors. He was popular in the Legion. He was one of the gods who'd supplanted Athena as a war deity. Aphrodite had mentioned him during their tea time chat in Charleston. Aside from that, Annabeth had no idea. Mithras just wasn't one of the gods they talked about at Camp Halfblood. She doubted the ghosts would wait while she whipped out Daedalus's laptop and did a search. She scanned the floor mosaic, seven pictures in a row. She studied the ghosts and noticed all of them wore some sort of badge on their toga, a raven or a torch or a bow. You have rites of passage, she blurted out, seven levels of membership, and the top level is the patter. The ghosts let out a collective gasp. Then they all began shouting at once. How does she know this? One demanded. The girl has gleaned our secrets. Silence, the patter ordered. But she might know about the ordeals, another cried. The ordeals, Annabeth said. I know about them. Another round of incredulous gasping. Ridiculous, the patter yelled. The girl lies. Daughter of Athena, choose your way of death. If you do not choose, the god will choose for you. Fire or dagger, Annabeth guessed. Even the patter looked stunned. Apparently he hadn't remembered there were victims of past punishments lying on the floor. How, how did you? He gulped. Who are you? A child of Athena, Annabeth said again. But not just any child. I am a... The matter in my sisterhood. The magna matter, in fact. There are no mysteries to me. Mithras cannot hide anything from my sight. The magna matter. A ghost wailed in despair. The big mother. Kill her! One of the ghosts charged, his hands out to strangle her, but he passed right through her. You're dead, Annabeth reminded him. Sit down. The ghost looked embarrassed and took his seat. We do not need to kill you ourselves, the patter growled. Mithras shall do that for us. The statue on the altar began to glow. Annabeth pressed her hands against the bricked-in doorway at her back. That had to be the exit. The mortar was crumbling, but it was not weak enough for her to break through with brute force. She looked desperately around the room, the cracked ceiling, the floor mosaic, the wall paintings and the carved altar. She began to talk, pulling deductions from the top of her head. It is no good, she said. I know all. You test your initiatives. You're with fire because the, the torch is the symbol of Mithras. His other symbol is the dagger, which is why you can also be tested with the blade. You want to kill me, just as, uh, as Mithras killed the sacred bull. It was a total guess, but the altar showed Mithras killing a bull, so Annabeth figured it must be important. The ghosts wailed and covered their ears. Some slapped their faces as if to wake up from a bad dream. The big mother knows, one said. It is impossible. Unless you look around the room, Annabeth thought, her confidence growing. She glared at the ghost who had just spoken. He had a raven badge on his toga, the same symbol as on the floor at her feet. You are just a raven, she scolded. That is the lowest rank. Be silent and let me speak to your putter. The ghost cringed. Mercy, mercy. At the front of the room, the putter trembled, either from rage or fear. Annabeth wasn't sure which. His pope, had his pope hat tilted sideways on his head like a fuel gauge dropping towards empty. Truly, you know much, big mother. Your wisdom is great. But that is all the more reason why you cannot leave. The weaver warned us you would come. The weaver? Annabeth realised with a sinking feeling what the patter was talking about. The thing in the dark from Percy's dream. The guardian of the shrine. This was one time she wished she didn't know the answer. But she tried to maintain her calm. The weaver fears me. She doesn't want me to follow the mark of Athena. But you will let me pass. You must choose an ordeal, the patter insisted. Fire or dagger. Survive one and then perhaps... Annabeth looked down at the bones of her siblings. The failures of your predecessors will guide you. They'd all chosen one or the other, fire or dagger. 
Maybe they thought they could beat the ordeal, but they had all died. Annabeth needed a third choice. She stared at the altar statue, which was glowing brighter by the second. She could feel its heat across the room. Her instinct was to focus on the dagger or the torch, but instead she concentrated on the statue's base. She wondered why its legs were stuck in stone. Then it occurred to her, maybe the little statue of Mifras wasn't stuck in the rock. Maybe he was emerging from the rock. Neither torch nor dagger, Annabeth said firmly. There is a third test, which I will pass. A third test, the patter demanded. Mifras was born from rock, Annabeth said, hoping she was right. He emerged fully grown from the stone, holding his dagger and torch. The screaming and wailing told her she had guessed correctly. The big mother knows all, a ghost cried. That is our most closely guarded secret. Then maybe you shouldn't put a statue of it in your altar, Annabeth thought. But she was thankful for stupid male ghosts. If they'd let women warriors into their cult, they might have learned some common sense. Annabeth gestured dr dramatically to the wall she'd come from. I was born from stone, just as Mifras was. Therefore, I have already passed your ordeal. Bah, the patter spat. You come from a hole in the wall? That's not the same thing. OK, so apparently the patter wasn't a complete moron, but Annabeth remained confident. She glanced at the ceiling and another idea came to her, all the details clicking together. I have control over the very stones. She raised her arms. I will prove my power is greater than Mifras. With a single strike, I will bring down the chamber. The ghosts wailed and trembled and looked at the ceiling, but Annabeth knew they didn't see what she saw. These ghosts were warriors, not engineers. The children of Athena had many skills, and not just in combat. Annabeth had studied architecture for years. She knew this ancient chamber was on the verge of collapse. She recognised what the stress fractures in the ceiling meant, all emanating from a single point, the top of the stone arch just above her. The capstone was about to crumble, and when that happened, assuming she could time it correctly. Impossible, the patter shouted. The weaver has paid us much tribute to destroy any children of Athena who would dare enter our shrine. We have never let her down. We cannot let you pass. Then you fear my power, Annabeth said. You admit that I could destroy your secret chamber. The pater scowled. He straightened his hat uneasily. Annabeth knew she'd put him in an impossible position. He couldn't back down without looking cowardly. Do your worst, child of Athena, he decided. No one can bring down the cavern of Mifras, especially with one strike, especially not a girl. Annabeth hefted her dagger. The ceiling was low. She could reach the capstone easily, but she'd have to make her one strike count. The doorway behind her was blocked, but in theory, if the room started to collapse, those bricks should weaken and crumble. She should be able to bust her way through before the entire ceiling came down, assuming, of course, that there was something behind the brick wall, not just solid earth, and assuming that Annabeth was quick enough and strong enough and lucky enough. Otherwise, she was about to be a demigod pancake. Well, boys, she said, looks like you chose the wrong war god. She struck the capstone. The celestial bronze blade shattered it like a sugar cube. For a moment, nothing happened. Ha! The patter gloated. You see, Athena has no power here. The room shook. A fissure ran across the length of the ceiling, and the far end of the cavern collapsed, burying the altar and the patter. More cracks widened, bricks fell from the arches, ghosts screamed and ran, but they couldn't seem to pass through the walls. Apparently they were bound to this chamber, even in death. Annabeth turned, she slammed against the blocked entrance with all her might, and the bricks gave way. As the cavern of Mifras imploded behind her, she lunged into darkness and found herself falling. Chapter 35. Annabeth. Annabeth thought she knew pain. She had fallen off the lava wall at Camp Halfblood. She'd been stabbed in the arm with a poison blade on the Williamsburg Bridge. She had even held the weight of the sky on her shoulders. But that was nothing compared to landing hard on her ankle. She immediately knew she'd broken it. Pain like a hot steel wire jabbed its way up her leg and into her hip. The world narrowed to just her, her ankle and the agony. She almost blacked out. Her head spun. Her breath became short and rapid. No, she told herself. You can't go into shock. She tried to breathe more slowly. She lay as still as possible until the pain subsided from absolute torture to just horrible throbbing. Part of her wanted to howl at the world for being so unfair. All this way just to be stopped by something as common as a broken ankle. She forced her emotions back down. At camp, she'd been trained to survive in all sorts of bad situations, including injuries like this. She looked around her. Her dagger had skittered a few feet away. In its dim light, she could make out the features of the room. She was lying on a cold floor of sandstone blocks. The ceiling was two stories tall. The doorway through which she'd fallen was ten feet off the ground, now completely blocked with debris that had cascaded into the room, making a rock slide. 
Scattered around her were old pieces of lumber, some cracked and desiccated, others broken into kindling. Stupid, she scolded herself. She'd lunged through that doorway, assuming there would be a level corridor or, or another room. It had never occurred to her that she'd be tumbling into space. The lumber had probably once been a staircase, long ago collapsed. She inspected her ankle. Her foot didn't appear too strangely bent. She could feel her toes. She didn't see any blood. That was all good. She reached out for a piece of lumber. Even that small bit of movement made her yelp. The board crumbled in her hand. The wood might be centuries old or even millennia. She had no way of knowing if this room was older than the Shrine of Misbras, or if, like the labyrinth, the rooms were a hodgepodge from many eras thrown randomly together. Okay, she said aloud, just to hear her voice. Think, Annabeth. Prioritise. She remembered a silly wilderness survival course Grover had taught her back at camp. At least it had seemed silly at the time. First step, scan your surroundings for immediate threats. This room didn't seem to be in danger of collapsing. The rock slide had stopped. The walls were solid blocks of stone with no major cracks that she could see. The ceiling was not sagging. Good. The only exit was on the far wall, an arched doorway that led into darkness. Between her and the doorway, a small brickwork trench cut, cut across the floor, letting water flow through the room from left to right. Maybe plumbing from the Roman days. If the water was drinkable, that was good too. Piled in one corner were some broken ceramic vases, spilling out shriveled brown clumps that might once have been fruit. Yuck. In another corner were some wooden crates that looked more intact and some wicker boxes bound with leather straps. So, no immediate danger, she said to herself, unless something comes barreling out of that dark tunnel. She glared at the doorway, almost daring her luck to get worse. Nothing happened. Okay, she said. Next step, take inventory. What could she use? She had her worst. Bo she had a water bottle and the more water in that trench if she could reach it. She had her knife. Her backpack was full of colourful string. Whee! Her laptop. The bronze map, some matches and some ambrosia for emergencies. Ah oh, yeah, this qualified as an emergency. She dug the godly food out of her pack and wolfed it down. As usual, it tasted like comforting memories. This time it was buttered popcorn. Movie night with her dad at his place in San Francisco. No stepmom, no stepbrothers, just Annabeth and her father curled up on the sofa watching sappy old romantic comedies. The ambrosia warmed her whole body. The pain in her leg became a dull throb. Annabeth knew she was still in major trouble. Even Ambrosia couldn't heal broken bones right away. It might speed up the process, but best case scenario, she wouldn't be able to put any weight on her foot for a day or more. She tried to reach her knife, but it was too far away. She scooted in that direction. Pain flared again like nails were piercing her foot. Her face beaded with sweat, but after one more scoot, she managed to reach the dagger. She felt better holding it, not just for light and protection, but also because it was so familiar. What next? Grover's survival class had mentioned something about staying put and waiting for rescue, but that wasn't going to happen. Even if Percy somehow managed to trace her steps, the cavern of Mithras had collapsed. She could try contacting someone with Daedalus's laptop, but she doubted she could get a signal down here. Besides, who would she call? She couldn't text anyone who was close enough to help. Demigods never carried cell phones because their signals attracted too many monstrous attention, and none of her friends would be sitting around checking their email. An iris message? She had water, but she doubted that she could make enough light for a rainbow. The only coin she had was her silver Athenian drachma, which didn't make a great tribute. There was another problem with calling for help. This was supposed to be a solo quest. If Annabeth did get rescued, she'd be admitting defeat. Something told her that the mark of Athena would no longer guide her. She could, she could wander down here forever, and she'd never find the Athena Parthenos. So, no good staying put and waiting for help, which meant she had to find a way to keep going on her own. She opened her water bottle and drank. She hadn't realised how thirsty she was. When the bottle was empty, she crawled to the gutter and refilled it. The water was cold and moving swiftly. Good signs that it might be safe to drink. She filled her bottle and then cupped some water in her hands and splashed her face. Immediately she felt more alert. She washed off and cleaned her scrapes as best she could. Annabeth sat up and glared at her ankle. You had to break, she scolded it. The ankle did not reply. She'd have to immobilise it in some sort of cast. That was the only way she'd be able to move. Hmm. She raised her dagger and inspected the room again in its bronze light. Now that she was closer to the open doorway, she liked it even less. It led into a dark, silent corridor. The air wafting out smelled sickly sweet and somehow evil. Unfortunately, Annabeth didn't see any other way she could go. With a lot of gasping and blinking back tears, she crawled over to the wreckage of the stairs. She found two planks that were in fairly good shape and long enough for a splint. Then she scooted over to the wicker boxes and used her knife to cut off the leather straps. 
While she was psyching herself up to immobilise her ankle, she noticed some faded words on one of the wooden crates. Hermes Express. Annabeth scooted excitedly towards the box. She had no idea what it, what it was doing here, but Hermes delivered all sorts of useful stuff to gods, spirits and even demigods. Maybe he dropped this care package here years ago to help demigods like her with this quest. She prized it open and pulled out several sheets of bubble wrap, but whatever had been inside was gone. Hermes, she protested. She stared glumly at the bubble wrap. Then her mind kicked into gear and she realised the wrapping was a gift. Oh, that's perfect. Annabeth covered her broken ankle in a bubble wrap cast. She set it with the lumbar splints and tied it all together with the leather straps. Once before, in first aid practice, she'd splinted a fake broken leg for another camper, but she'd never imagined she'd have to make a splint for herself. It was hard, painful work, but finally it was done. She searched the wreckage of the stairs until she found part of the railing, a narrow board about four feet long that could serve as a crutch. She put her back against the wall, got her good leg ready and hauled herself up. Whoa! Black spots danced in her eyes, but she stayed upright. Next time, she muttered to the dark room, just let me fight a monster. Much easier. Above the door, open doorway, the mark of Athena blazed to life against the arch. The fiery owl seemed to be watching her expectantly, as if to say, about time. Oh, you want monsters? Right this way. Annabeth wondered if that burning mark was based on a real sacred owl. If so, when she survived, she was going to find that owl and punch it in the face. That thought lifted her spirits. She made it across the trench and hobbled slowly into the corridor. Chapter 36. Annabeth. The tunnel ran straight and smooth, but after her fall, Annabeth decided to take no chances. She used the wall for support and tapped the floor in front of her with her crutch to make sure there were no traps. As she walked, the sickly sweet smell got stronger and set her nerves on edge. The sound of running water faded behind her. In its place came a dry chorus of whispers like a million tiny voices. They seemed to be coming from inside the walls and they were getting louder. Annabeth tried to speed up, but she couldn't go much faster without losing her balance or jarring her broken ankle. She hobbled onward, convinced that something was following her. The small voices were massing together, getting closer. She touched the wall and her hand came back covered in cobwebs. She yelped, then cursed herself for making a sound. It's only a web, she told herself, but that didn't stop the roaring in her ears. She'd expected spiders. She knew what was ahead. The weaver, her ladyship, the voice in the dark. But the webs made her realise how close she was. Her hand trembled as she wiped it on the stones. What had she been thinking? She couldn't do this quest alone. Too late, she told herself. Just keep going. She made her way down the corridor one painful step at a time. The whispering sounds got louder behind her until they sounded like millions of dried leaves swirling in the wind. The cobwebs became thicker, filling the tunnel. Soon she was pushing them out of her face, ripping through gauzy curtains that covered her like silly string. Her heart wanted to break out of her chest and run. She stumbled ahead more recklessly, trying to ignore the pain in her ankle. Finally, the corridor ended in a doorway, filled waist-high with old lumber. It looked as if, as if someone had tried to barricade the opening. That didn't bode well, but Annabeth used her crutch to push away the boards as best she could. She crawled over the remaining pile, getting a few dozen splinters in her free hand. On the other, other side of the barricade was a chamber the size of a basketball court. The floor was done in Roman mosaics. The remains of tapestries hung from the walls. Two unlit torches sat in wall sconces on either side of the doorway, both covered in cobwebs. At the far end of the room, the mark of Athena burned over another doorway. Unfortunately, between Annabeth and that exit, the floor was bisected by a chasm 50 feet across. Spanning the pit were two parallel wooden beams, too far apart for both feet, but each too narrow to walk on unless Annabeth was an acrobat, which she wasn't, and didn't have a broken angle, ankle which she did. The corridor she'd come from was filled with hissing noises. Cobwebs trembled and danced as the first of the spiders appeared. No larger than gumdrops, but plump and black, skittering over the walls and the floor. What kind of spiders? Annabeth had no idea. She only knew they were coming for her, and she only had seconds to figure out a plan. Annabeth wanted to sob. She wanted someone, anyone, to be here for her. She wanted Leo with his fire skills, or Jason with his lightning, or Hazel to collapse the tunnel. Most of all, she wanted Percy. She always felt braver when Percy was with her. I'm not going to die here, she told herself. I'm going to see Percy again. The first spiders were almost to the door. Behind them came the bulk of the army, a black sea of creepy crawlies. Annabeth hobbled to one of the wall sconces and snatched up the torch. The end was coated in pitch for easy lighting. Her fingers felt like lead, but she rummaged through her backpack and found the matches. She struck one and set the torch ablaze. 
She thrusted into the barricade. The old dry wood caught immediately. Flames leapt to the cobwebs and roared down the corridor in a flash fire, roasting spiders by the thousands. Annabeth stepped back from her bonfire. She'd brought herself some time, but she doubted that she'd killed all the spiders. They would regroup and swarm again as soon as the fire died. She stepped to the edge of the chasm. She shone her light into the pit, but she couldn't see the bottom. Jumping in would be suicide. She could try to cross one of the bars hand over hand, but she didn't trust her arm strength, and she didn't see how she would be able to haul herself up with a full backpack and a broken ankle once she reached the other side. She crouched and studied the beams. Each had a set of iron hooks, eye, eye hooks along the inside, set at one foot intervals. Maybe the rails had been the sides of a bridge and the middle planks had been removed or destroyed. But eye hooks? These weren't for supporting planks. More like... She glanced at the walls. The same kind of hooks had been used to hang the shredded tapestries. She realised the planks weren't meant as a bridge. They were some kind of loom. Annabeth threw her flaming torch to the other side of the chasm. She had no faith her plan would work, but she pulled all the string out of her backpack and began weaving between the beams, stringing a cat's cradle pattern back and forth from eye hook to eye hook, doubling and tripling the line. Her hands moved with blazing speed. She stopped thinking about the task and just did it, looping and tying off lines, slowly extending her woven net over the pit. She forgot the pain in her leg and the fiery barricade guttering out behind her. She inched over the chasm. The weaving held her weight. Before she knew it, she was halfway across. How had she learned to do this? It's Athena, she told herself. My mother's skill was with useful crafts. Weaving had never seemed particularly useful to Annabeth. Until now. She glanced behind her. The barricade fire was dying. A few spiders crawled in around the edges of the doorway. Desperately, she continued weaving, and finally she made it across. She snatched up the torch and thrust it into her woven bridge. Flames raced along the string. Even the beams caught fire as if they'd been pre-soaked in oil. For a moment, the bridge burned in a clear pattern, a fiery row of identical owls. Had Annabeth really woven them into the string, or was it some kind of magic? She didn't know, but as the spiders began to cross, the beams crumbled and collapsed into the pit. Annabeth held her breath. She didn't see any reason why the spiders couldn't reach her by climbing the walls or the ceiling. If they started to do that, she'd have to run for it, and she was pretty sure she couldn't move fast enough. For some reason, the spiders didn't follow. They massed at the edge of the pit, a seething black carpet of creepiness. Then they dispersed, flooding back into the burnt corridor, almost as if Annabeth was no longer interesting. Or I passed a test, she said aloud. Her torch sputtered out, leaving her with only the light of her dagger. She realised that she'd left her makeshift crutch on the other side of the chasm. She felt exhausted and out of tricks, but her mind was clear. Her panic seemed to have burned up along with that woven bridge. The weaver, she thought. I must be close. At least I know what's ahead. She made her way down the next corridor, hopping to keep the weight off her bad foot. She didn't have far to go. After twenty feet, the tunnel opened into a cavern, as large as a cathedral, so majestic that Annabeth had trouble processing everything she saw. She guessed that this was the room from Percy's dream. But it wasn't dark. Bronze braziers of magical light, like the gods used on Mount Olympus, glowed around the circumference of the room, interspersed with gorgeous tapestries. The stone floor was webbed with fissures like a sheet of ice. The ceiling was so high it was lost in the gloom and layers upon layers of spider webs. Strands of silk as thick as pillars ran from the ceiling all over the room, anchoring the walls and the floor like the cables of a suspension bridge. Webs also surrounded the centrepiece of the shrine, which was so intimidating that Annabeth had trouble raising her eyes to look at it. Looming over her was a forty-foot-tall statue of Athena, with luminous ivory skin and a dress of gold. In her outstretched hand, Athena held a statue of Nike, the winged victory goddess, a statue that looked tiny from here, but was probably as tall as a real person. Athena's other hand rested on a shield as big as a billboard, with a sculpted snake peeking out from behind, as if Athena was protecting it. The goddess's face was serene and kindly, and it looked like Athena. Annabeth had seen many statues that didn't resemble her mum at all, but this giant version, made thousands of years ago, made her think that the artist must have met Athena in person. He had captured her perfectly. Athena Parthenos, Annabeth murmured. It's really here. All her life, she had wanted to visit the Parthenon. Now she was seeing the main attraction that used to be there, and she was the first child of Athena to do so in millennia. She realised her mouth was hanging open. She forced herself to swallow. Annabeth could have stood there all day looking at the statue, but she had only accomplished half her mission. She had found the Athena Parthenos. Now, how could she rescue it from the cavern? 
Strands of web covered it like a gauze pavilion. Annabeth suspected that without those webs, the statue would get, have fallen through the weakened floor long ago. As she stepped into the room, she could see that the cracks below were so wide she could have lost her foot in them. Beneath the cracks, she saw nothing but empty darkness. A chill washed over her. Where was the guardian? How could Annabeth free the statue without collapsing the floor? She couldn't very well shove the Athena Parthenos down the corridor that she'd come from. She scanned the chamber, hoping to see something that might help. Her eyes wandered over the tapestries, which were heart-wrenchingly beautiful. One showed a pastoral scene, so three-dimensional it could have been a window. Another tapestry showed the gods battling the giants. Annabeth saw a landscape of the underworld. Next to it was the skyline of modern Rome, and in the tapestry to her left, she caught her breath. It was a portrait of two demigods kissing underwater, Annabeth and Percy. The day their friends had thrown them into the canoe lake at camp, it was so lifelike that she wondered if the weaver had been there lurking in the lake with a waterproof camera. How is that possible? She murmured. Above her in the gloom, a voice spoke. For ages I have known that you would come, my sweet. Annabeth shuddered. Suddenly she was seven years old again, hiding under her covers, waiting for the spiders to attack her in the night. The voice sounded just as Percy had described, an angry buzz in multiple tones, female but not human. In the webs above the statue something moved, something dark and large. I have seen you in my dreams, the voice said, sickly sweet and evil, like the smell in the corridors. I had to make sure you were worthy, the only child of Athena clever enough to pass my tests and reach this place alive. Indeed, you are her most talented child. This will make your death so much more painful to my old enemy when you fail utterly. The pain in Annabeth's ankle was nothing compared to the icy acid now filling her veins. She wanted to run. She wanted to plead for mercy, but she couldn't show weakness. Not now. You're Arachne, she called out. The weaver, who was turned into a spider. The figure descended, becoming clearer and more horrible. Cursed by your mother, she said, scorned by all and made into a hideous thing because I was the better weaver. But you lost the contest, Annabeth said. That's the story written by the winner, cried Arachne. Look on my work. See for yourself. Annabeth didn't have to. The tapestries were the best she'd ever seen. Better than the witch Circe's work. And yes, even better than some weaving she'd seen on Mount Olympus. She wondered if her mother truly had lost. If, she, if she'd hidden Arachne away and rewritten the truth. But right now it didn't matter. You've been guarding this statue since the ancient times, Annabeth guessed. But it doesn't belong here. I'm taking it back. Ha! Arachne said. Even Annabeth had to admit her throat sounded, her threat sounded ridiculous. How could one girl in a bubble wrap ankle cast remove this huge statue from its underground chamber? I'm afraid you would have to defeat me first, my sweet, Arachne said. And alas, that is impossible. The creature appeared from the curtains of webbing, and Annabeth realised that her quest was hopeless. She was about to die. Arachne had the body of a giant black widow, with a hairy red hourglass mark on the underside of her abdomen, and a pair of oozing spinnerets. Her eight spindly legs were lined with curved barbs, as big as Annabeth's dagger. If the spider came any closer, her sweet stench alone would have been enough to make, to make Annabeth faint. But the most horrible part was her misshapen face. She might once have been a beautiful woman. Now black mandibles protruded from her mouth like tusks. Her other teeth had grown into thin white needles. Fine dark whiskers dotted her cheeks. Her eyes were large, lidless and pure black, with two smaller eyes sticking out of her temples. The creature made a violent rip, rip, rip sound that might have been laughter. Now, I will feast on you, my sweet, Arachne said. But do not fear. I will make a beautiful tapestry depicting your death.